Back in my early 20s, I was trying to kick a major four-year heroin addiction. Like I said, trying. On my own, which meant that I wasn't using as much and it would be months in between. On this faithful day, someone had given me two OC-80s. This is when the price of such goodies hasn't reached the almost hundred dollar a piece mark. I had never seen these. They were fairly new on the streets, so after getting off of work at the little coffee shop I worked at, I popped the two teeny tiny treats in my mouth and hopped on the train to head into Boston to go see one of my fave punk bands. Now, anyone who knows about kicking a habit, when you start to use less, your tolerance goes down. So number one rule there is, is use less than you're used to and I had no idea how strong one of these things were, and like I said, major habit. So of course I took them both, and for those who don't know, one OC80 is enough to let a 200 pound junkie feel good. So being a 110 pound girl that hasn't touched the stuff in a couple of months, I don't even remember the show, never mind do I know how I got on the train and off at my stop. Anyways, by the time I got to my ratty little borough of Beantown, I was throwing up every 20 feet or so. I could barely keep my eyes open, but I didn't live in a very good part of the city, and curling up on a corner and hoping I didn't die was not an option. So I propped myself up along the walls and was trying to inconspicuously hurl while trying to make the five blocks to my apartment. I was about halfway there when I noticed a shitty car going really slow behind me. I figured whoever was in it was looking for a hooker. The part of town I lived in, anyone could be a hooker. So I just turned and looked at him and shook my head. This was usually enough to get them to drive on. It wasn't. Guy pulls right up to me in this like 30 year old crappy green Honda or something and says in a very thick, what I'm guessing, and please don't tear me apart for not knowing, Korean accent. You need help? Get in, get in. The man looked to be about 30, and of Asian descent, dressed in jeans, blue tattered t-shirt, and I kid you not, a tux jacket. That has nothing to do with anything, I just thought it strange. Living in Boston, you see some strange stuff. Now, even being a junky, punk chick, I was always a polite girl who was so nice to strangers as to not hurt anyone's feelings, and because of this, I would get myself into dangerous situations, and I knew this, so I just wiped the puke off my mouth and smiled at the guy and said, Thanks but my boyfriend is waiting for me just down the street. There was no boyfriend, and I actually had quite a bit of blocks to cover, but I was nice, not stupid. Well, not that stupid, considering the pill-sickened state I had put myself in. Mr. Man says, You're sick. You need ride. Okay, guy can't take a hint. I told him again that I didn't need a ride, but thanks. I started to walk faster and cross the street. Unfortunately, it was a one way, and he pulled up close enough to the curb that he could grab me from the driver's seat. All right, now I'm getting scared. It's almost 3 a.m., and no one is out on this side of the street. No, you get in now. I was feeling really sick and embarrassed at this point. I was trying to hold off throwing up in front of this guy, and I know I'm about to hurl again and getting pissed, so I yelled. No, I know get in now. Look dude, I'm not gonna suck your dick, so just fucking leave. And then I puked. Now, I was always on the small side and hung around and lived in places where it was a good idea to have some sort of protection. Tonight I had my gravity knife tucked in my boot, so when Mr. 
Good Samaritan started to get out of his car as I bent over. I pulled it and let the blade slide out as I stood up and said, Please, just leave me the fuck alone. His eyes focused on the knife and he got back in the car. Like I said before, his car was a piece of shit, so when he took off, it was really loud. I watched him turn the corner and started back on my wall crawl home. As I turned the next corner, lo and behold, there he was at the end of that street. He took off again when he saw me stop and stand there looking at him, but the whole way back home, I would either see him or hear his muffler. I still hadn't put my knife away because I knew if he actually got a hold of me, I was in no condition to be able to get him off of me without a lucky stab. He actually drove by me as I was fighting to open the door to my crappy little duplex. My roommate and I lived on the bottom floor, but once I got in, I felt pretty safe enough to crawl to the couch and pass out because my roommate's big ass skinhead boyfriend was there with her in his pit something mix, who was a love bug but smart enough to know when not to be. When I finally woke up the following evening, those things hit me really hard. My roommate told me she couldn't believe I had slept through all the ruckus. Apparently the dog had started barking around 4.30 a.m. and wouldn't stop, so they let him out of the room and tried to go back to sleep. But Rudy wasn't having that. They came back out to tell him to shut up and he was running back and forth between the back corner window and the window behind the couch I was passed out on, which was the actual backside, finally standing on the couch over me and going batshit crazy, acting like he was trying to bite through the friggin' glass without me waking up. My roommate later told me she had checked to make sure I hadn't OD'd and died. This was the point where my roomie's boyfriend decided to go check out what the heck his dog was trying to kill. He grabbed the bat we kept by the door and made his way to the back where the window met the couch. He heard a lot of noise going on on the other side. Living in a crappy part of the city, there was a lot of crap around the building. And then a car starting up. A loud car. By the time he ran to the front, the car was halfway down our street. When he made his way back around to check the window Rudy was trying to eat through, there was a bunch of crates to move from under the first window he was barking at, stacked up under the window where the couch was, and the screen had been cut where you put your fingers through to open it. I always read these threads where people say, I'm getting goosebumps just writing this and shake my head thinking so overdramatic. And now I feel like an a-hole, because there really is no way to describe how you feel reliving this. Over the next few weeks, the boyfriend and super mutt stayed at our place because we kept hearing noises, and imagined or not, it scared the hell out of us. Quite a few times the boyfriend would run out when we would hear something, and would sometimes even catch a glimpse of the guy as he went around a corner, but he was never fast enough. Boyfriend would blame it on the guy being ninja fast, but we just knew he was too slow. Some may ask why we didn't just let Rudy out. This was a point in time in my state where they were thinking of outlawing pit bulls. They had a really bad rap. If we had let him out, Rudy would have caught him, and that would just end bad on a lot of levels. But seriously, what kind of person still tries to get into a house with a psycho pit bull and a 6'2 skinhead trying to kill you with a baseball bat? Now you might ask why we didn't call the cops. Well, like I said, I was into some bad stuff, and as a rule, punks don't like cops. However, the neighborhood I lived in, we all talked to each other, and some of them were cop callers. My next door neighbor knew what was going on, and called the cops one night when she heard someone in her kitchen. She lived alone, 
she locked herself in her bathroom and started yelling that the cops were on their way. But the guy was persistent and was trying to pick the lock from the outside until he actually heard sirens and booked it. The lady said she heard a loud car start and looked out the bathroom window that faced the street to see, you guessed it, a crappy old green car drive away. When I heard about this, I felt really bad. I mean, this lady was like 87 or so and lives alone. What would have happened if that dude got in? Why oh why didn't we let Rudy eat him? When the cops finally got there, the three of us were outside, so they started asking us if we heard or seen anything, so we told them what had been going on, and I gave a description of who I had thought was doing it, but also said I wasn't sure of details because I hadn't been feeling well at the time. The cop that was writing it down almost threw his pad and pen down, saying that if people like us, punk rock, smarted up and called the police, they could have got this guy. Apparently Mr. Get In Now fit the same description as the guy they were looking for that was wanted for quite a few sexual assaults around the train station. Now I felt really bad, but still had to give the cop lip over the people like us statement. But that's not the point. I've been clean over 15 years and don't live near town anymore, so I'm pretty sure I would handle things different now and I know if I hadn't been messed up, then I would have. As far as I know, they never caught the guy. So Mr. Get In Now, let's not meet, because I will let my dog chew your ass. I use Tinder pretty frequently, and it's usually cool. Just meeting people, chilling, smoking with most of them. So, I match with this guy named Charlie, and he seems cool. He's really cute, and he plays music, which is really appealing to me, as I also sing and play the piano. We talk for a little while, and I agree to meet him at his house. Mistake number one. Why did I think it was a good idea to meet a stranger in their home? I don't drive, so I take an Uber over, and it's a decent way away, so it's kind of pricey. When he buzzes me into the apartment complex, I got this really creepy vibe, but I shook it off as just nerves. I go up to the third floor, and he's standing at the door. Things are cool, we're just chilling. We smoked a couple of bowls, and we're watching a movie. So, he makes a move on me? and I go with it. We end up on the bed, and we're obviously engaging in adult activities, when out of nowhere, he wraps his hands around my neck. Hard. Now, that's all fine and good with me. I mean, I can dig that in the right setting. But alone in a stranger's house, when he didn't even check to see if it was cool, is not one of those settings. I literally can't breathe, and I'm fairly certain I'm turning blue at this point and he's just relentless. Not only is he asphyxiating me, he's now yelling in my face. <laughs> Are you scared? I started to struggle, and he was gripping even harder. I seriously thought I was going to die. By some miracle, I wriggle out of his grasp and start screaming. He's yelling at me to calm down, and I'm frantically trying to put on my clothes. He grabs my wrist as I'm trying to leave and I use all of my strength to pull away and slam the door. As it was closing, the charming guy bid me adieu with the words, Fucking cunt. I get home, and I look in the mirror, and I have a bruise on my neck. I tried to cover it with makeup, to no avail. I look like I was almost strangled to death. Then, he texts me, saying, I think you need more than one dick. And I'm like, Really? You want to bring a friend and kill me together? Anyway, I blocked him and reported him on Tinder. I wish I could have done more, because I seriously think he would have killed me. I've been debating going to the police, but the bruises are gone, and it's a he said, she said thing. But I'm really starting to wonder if I should. 
because the next girl might not be so lucky. Despite a few creepy instances as a child, there has only been one time in my adult life that I have truly felt primal fear. I live in a village in the middle of the English countryside. To paint an accurate picture of its size, it has a population of 4,000, but feels more like 1,000 due to its spread out nature and being surrounded on all sides by lots of fields, farms, and woods that eventually connects onto a pretty famous forest. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and because of this, has notoriously bad phone and internet connections. Having lived here all my life, I know the place like the back of my hand. I know where all the public footpaths through the woods and fields are, where they connect, which are shortcuts, and where to cross deep streams, etc. I've gone on walks in this area throughout my childhood with parents and alone as an adult. Nothing bad had happened. I felt safe here. This story took place last summer in July, after I moved back home from university, had yet to get a job, and smoked a lot of weed. A habit my parents despised, and which I tried to keep hidden from them by going for evening walks, multiple pre-rolled joints hidden away in my hoodie pocket. As usual, this day they both got home at 5 p.m. We had dinner, but chatted for a while longer than usual as my mom had had quite a hectic day and was telling me about it. Because of this, I ended up heading out for my walk an hour later than routine, around 7 p.m. But as it was summer, the sun was still shining, so... Honestly, I didn't really notice that it would start getting dark while I was still out. The woodland closest to my house is less than five minutes away, and you enter through a gate into a farmer's field. You can see across the open area quite far until the first set of small woods obscures your view. That's where I was heading, as I knew this track takes under two hours and leads back onto the same path I was standing on now. More than enough time to smoke the three joints in my pocket and for the smell to leave my clothing, I had thought. This entire area is very popular for dog walkers, so it's not unusual to see other people while you are about, and as this is a village everybody says hello to everybody. I lit my first joint and started walking. I'm just in my own world for a while, until I was less than a hundred feet feet before the entrance to the woods. An elderly man was coming out of them throwing a ball for his collie dog. I finished my joint and stubbed it out. As I got closer, I recognized it was John who lived on the road next to mine and knew my grandpa. We stopped and said hello as I stroked his dog Max. While talking, I see another man coming out of the woods. No dog, bright green jacket very tall and had a good ten years on me age-wise. Me and John chat another minute and say goodbye. He warns me not to stay out here too long as it will start getting dark soon. True the sky was bright pink and orange. The sun was indeed beginning to set. I hadn't really noticed. I continued on down the path towards the man. When we were nearly passing each other, I look up to make brief eye contact, smile, and say hello, like everyone here does, even if you don't recognize the person. My eyes instantly met his. He was already looking at me. His dark eyes locked on mine. He wasn't smiling. I didn't know him at all, but I knew something was wrong. It was in his eyes. I swallowed my politeness and looked at the ground as we passed. I had lived in my uni city the past couple of years, so I knew a red flag when I saw one, and my country bumpkin manners evaporated. I quickened my pace a little, and before entering the woods, slyly looked back. The guy was still walking in the same direction, following John. 
I felt relieved, laughed, cursed the weed for making me paranoid while lighting up another joint and started walking into the woods. It takes about 30 minutes to follow the path through the woods to the end. The pathway exited open into another field that led to another set of woods. The sky was now violet, the dimming light having been obscured to me by the trees. I was already smoking my last joint and was near the entrance to the second set of woods when I felt it. Fear. Complete, crippling, absolute fear worked its way like electricity through every layer of flesh. I'd never felt anything like it before or since, but I knew what it was. I whipped around. Standing at the exit of the first set of woods was the man. I could still make out his green jacket in the fading light. He fucking doubled back, and very quickly too. I had looked back several times while in those trees, and he hadn't been there. For a second I froze, as did he. He knew I'd seen. To sprint the distance between us would take him about five minutes. He was obviously in good shape. I threw the spliff and fucking bolted into the woods. The only way I could go. I didn't dare look behind me. I sprinted for a couple of minutes before taking a sharp left turn off the path into the trees. Hoping to throw him off a bit, but I couldn't see a fucking thing. The light was already darkening and the trees made it 100 times worse, especially as I was now in the thick of them. Their branches catching on my clothes like fingers, whipping and scratching my bare legs so bad I bled. I ran and ran, my lungs protesting in pain, hating me for smoking so much, while my heart was throwing itself against my ribcage trying to escape. I couldn't anymore. I threw myself on the ground behind a particularly thick trunk, my back against it, knees to my chest, hand thrown over my mouth to stifle my labored breathing, desperately trying to pump air into my lungs for the next sprint. I listened for the first time. A few seconds pass silently, then I hear him, heavy footfalls snapping twigs behind me and about 20 feet to my left. I dare not look in case he sees me. I have my phone, but I know I have little chance of signal being where I was, and knew he'd either hear me talking or see the light from the display. I'm not ashamed to say at this point I start to cry, the tears falling silently down my cheeks. What the fuck? I hear a deep voice exclaim. Where are you? I knew you are here. I saw you. I have to clasp both hands across my mouth to stop my scream escaping. I can hear him moving around. I panic, and I find enough courage to slowly peek from behind the tree. He was about ten feet behind me, less than twenty feet to the left, with his back to me. I move back and my eyes search the area around me. I pick up a pretty heavy rock. I carefully check on him again. His back is still turned, but he's searching through the trees, hunched down lower to the ground now. I make a snap decision, and with everything I had left, I threw the rock behind me and to the right. It clattered through the branches of trees and made one hell of a noise. I watched him immediately bolt in its direction, laughing. He fucking laughed. I paused a little hearing his footsteps get quieter until I thought I wouldn't be so visible to him if I moved and threw myself forward. I ran, trying to put as much distance between us as possible, but I was also aware that I was getting further and further away from home. I knew there had to be a stream somewhere close. If I found the stream, I can follow it as it borders the land and ran parallel to some of the footpaths. I ran. I ran and ran until the trees finally cleared and I can just make out another field through them on the other side. I thank God 
and push myself a little bit further till I'm out of the trees and the ground disappears from below my feet and I go head over shoulders down the stream embankment. I crash into the water below, my open mouth and lungs filling with muddy water. As I splutter it out, I feel both relieved to have found the stream and terrified he's heard me. My phone is now ruined. I slowly make my way downstream as quiet as possible, listening out for him the whole time as the stream borders the woods, looking up periodically just in case. After a while, maybe half an hour, I notice the trees begin to thin out and realize this is the edge of the woods where I would have been exiting and where the pathway connected to the original one I'd started on. If I ran, I could get home in less than 20 minutes. As quiet as I could, I dragged myself on my stomach back up on the embankment army style, wanting to stay as low as possible. I peeked over the top. I could just make out the opening of the woods exit path about 50 feet away. I sat and scanned the forest line for a couple of minutes, my eyes trying to make out movement despite it being pitch black. Nothing. I couldn't hear anything either. I pushed myself up and sprinted as fast as I could across the field onto the pathway. I knew the gate I entered through was in the adjoining field. It really wasn't far. I was so happy. You fucking bitch! Came a screech from across the field. I swear my legs nearly gave out then and there. He had been waiting for me. I turned my head and saw him sprinting out of the woods at full pelt. I screamed and pushed myself further, tears coating my face. All I could do was run. I crossed into the main field now and I could see the moonlight shining off the metal gate. My house was just five minutes away after that. I have never focused on anything as much as that gate. He was faster than me and getting closer, screaming at me the whole time about how he was going to slit my throat. I ran and ran, pushing myself up and over the gate and ran up the road. I dared look as I made the turning for my road. He was still fucking following me. I raced up my driveway and threw myself through the door running into the living room crying and screaming hysterically, pointing behind me towards the door. My dad ran outside while my mom grabbed a hold of me as I collapsed shaking. As it turns out, my parents had already called the police. As I said I was going out for an hour or so at 7 and it was now past 12 a.m., and I hadn't answered when they had called my now broke phone. Very unlike me. We called the police again to explain. They came and I gave a full statement. Both my parents and the police were horrified. Nothing like this happens here. There hasn't been a reported rape or murder in the last 100 years. But one look at me, and it was obvious I was telling the truth. I was covered head to toe in cuts and bruises, soaking wet and covered in mud and blood. I won't go into how this experience changed me. It's depressing. But I will say that the thing that scares me the most is that they never even had a suspect. Despite him following me so closely, he was gone by the time my dad ran outside. That guy is still out there and who knows what he is really capable of. My mum had been a drug addict my entire life. When I was younger, she constantly had people coming and going, and it seemed that a majority of the time, these people were shady. <laughs> what did I expect? I thought I'd share one experience that still bothers me quite a bit. I was about 12 years old at the time. I was sitting on the couch watching Drake and Josh when there came a knock at the door. My mum wasn't home at the time, so I decided to turn the TV off 
and remained quiet. Eloise, you're home? It was a man. I just wanted to drop something off. Eloise, I stayed quiet. Eloise, open the damn door. I'm not going to hurt you. At this point, I was scared. Even as a 12 year old, when someone says they're not going to hurt you, there's generally something they did in the past that would prompt them to reassure someone of that. Right? He started rattling the door handle. I swear to God, I will break this door down. You've been ignoring my calls, my texts. You cannot run from me. He began pounding and kicking at the door. I ran to the bathroom because it was the only door with a lock and hid in the bathtub with the curtain drawn. I decided to take my bath gun as I was still young and had not yet outgrown playing with toys during bath time. I put a little water in it and a little shampoo in it. At that point, I heard what sounded like splitting wood and then footsteps in my living room. I heard him go from room to room, all the while yelling. Eloise, you can't ignore me now, you bitch. Finally, he came to the bathroom door and tried the handle. Oh, so you're in there, huh? More pounding. He kicked the door in and stood still for a few long moments before ripping open the curtain and peering down at me. He had slick black hair with piercing green eyes, a sad attempt at facial hair, black hooded sweatshirt, black jeans, black shoes, and he held a brown bag in one of his tattoo covered hands. Oh, <laughs> even better. I've seen you around here before. You're Eloise's daughter. So sweet. He kept repeating that. So sweet. It made my skin crawl. He walked over to the window and locked it before squatting next to me. You're gonna come with me. How about that? I'll buy you some ice cream. I glared at him, trying my best not to look terrified. Not much of a talker. Your mother could learn something from you. He reached his hand out and rested it on my shoulder. In one quick motion, I pulled my squirt gun from under my leg and began spraying it in his face. He didn't register it at first, but quickly began wiping his eyes. What the fuck is this? What the fuck, what the fuck? I hurled my body at him, causing him to fall back and hit his head on the toilet. I grabbed the brown paper bag and ran from the bathroom, out into the hallway and down the stairs. I caught my mum on the entrance steps and pulled her the other direction. What's going on? You're making me drop my things. She quickly caught on that something was terribly wrong and ran with me to my aunt's house. After catching my breath, I described the man and what he did. She quickly recognised him as a man named Tony, whom she owed a lot of money to. I realised I was still holding the brown paper bag that the man had and gave it to my mum. She found a gun inside. He had showed up to kill my mother. <laughs>